Tonight we continue our series of pre-election interviews with a candidate for U.S. Senator from Massachusetts in the Republican primary on September 4th. We'd like to welcome John Kingston. Chris, great to be here with you. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, John. First of all, tell us about your background because it's in business, it's in the Republican Party, but also in a very unusual way, too. Sure, sure, sure. Well, well look, you, you, you know, all of our life stories have you know, start when you, where you come from or where you grew up. But I grew up in a small town, working class America, a uh, small town in Connecticut. And, and from there, you know, I, some, some, something about my, uh, my adventurous spirit. I went off to, um, you know, uh, fancy schools with uh, lots, of, lots of loans um, and uh, hard work. And, and uh, you know what, time, time went by. And, and uh, because of this great country, the opportunities I was provided, the, the, the avenues I, I was able to pursue, I became successful, more successful than I ever thought I'd be. And uh, was successful in the investment management industry, but along the way, and this is you know very important for for my campaign, the businessman outsider campaign that I'm running, you know one which which is uh, is built upon the idea that I've, I've worked my entire life to bring people together of goodwill across racial, ethnic, uh, partisan divides to to try to do great things in this country, challenge tired norms, and do good things for our country, and that's what I'm trying to do in this campaign. In 2016, it, it looks as if you were backing neither Trump nor Clinton, and you were trying to make it possible for another option. Um, um, what does that say about somebody running now in a Republican primary? Well, I think, I think what, what, what voters in Massachusetts want is, is uh, somebody who's a problem solver, who loves our country, independent-minded, right? You know, we're, we're a pragmatic lot here in Massachusetts, and we don't like the extremes like Elizabeth Warren. We don't like the, the, the extremism on either side. And, and, I, and I showed the voters of Massachusetts in, in 2016 that, that I'm willing to put, you know, principle um, over, you know, over partisanship and party. I'm, I'm willing to put service and country first. And, and I think that's going to do very well for me in the fall. Of course, these days, uh, one of the common places we keep hearing is that the Republican Party is not what it was even a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. This is a Trump party. Uh, can you be the kind of Republican I think you'd like to be if you get elected with that current situation? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Massachusetts is a perfect, perfect place. So, you know, I, I talk about this all the time, right? You look, 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 look on your license plates. Um, people don't even notice this, but it's, it's the spirit of America. You know, the spirit of Massachusetts is the spirit of America. You know, we, we helped invent this, you know, great, you know, American experiment in democracy. And I believe I can help catalyze a movement that comes from here in Massachusetts, sensible, sensible values being brought to Washington. And, and I, I think the, the voters of Massachusetts are going to respond favorably to that. Well, I'm, I'm sure one issue among all the candidates in, in the primary is immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you like to see done? Well, here, here's a, an example of, of, of broken Washington, right? I gave a speech last night in, in Charlestown, um, you know, in the shadow of the Bunker Hill Monument about fixing broken Washington. And immigration's a perfect example of that. You know, for a dozen years plus, there have been reasonable proposals that come to the floor, um, you know, brought by both sides, you know, in a bipartisan basis. Uh, and, and, and yet nothing gets done. And, and it hangs over the American people. It's just wrong. You know, there, there's great uh, uh, consensus on the idea that we should have enhanced border security. 75% of Americans think we should make sure our borders are secure. We decide who comes into this great country, by, you know, by rule of law. 75% uh, of the people in the country think that, well, if you're breaking the law when you're here um, and, you're, and you came here illegally in the first place, we, you know, you should, we should send you back. You know, there's great consensus on these things, and, and, and yet nothing gets done. And it's tragic. We don't have that many people coming here these days because they're persecuted by communism or fascism, but we do have a lot of people coming in, maybe illegally, yeah. um, who are fleeing what they say are life-threatening situations. It could be gangs in Central America or persecution of gays and lesbians in Africa. Mm. Should people like that have some kind of status to recognize those problems? My goodness, the, mo the most, the, you're asking one of the most challenging of all questions. The, 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 pro the problem is that, that all of these things seem to be ri raising to it like a, uh, you know, a, 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 um, a supremely challenging status. We're, you know, getting us all in a, in, a, in, a, in a whirl, you know, day in, day out, because Congress, uh, Capitol Hill hasn't, hasn't done its basics on this. So, so all those tough questions are downstream of some basic questions. If we had solid border security that we all agreed upon, um, then in a meaningful, rational way, we can uh, you know, assess those tougher questions. But when we ass assess those tougher questions, and you're asking a good one, then, then the, the 
combination of security interest of the country can be married with our natural, you know, instinct to be humane in America. It's humanity and security both at the same time, not one or the other. The far left seems to, you know, disregard the security interests and want open borders. And then sometimes the, you know, the, the, the far right seems to not be as concerned as the humanity of the matter. Most Americans can, can recognize that both things can happen at the same time. Another issue I'm sure is gonna be coming up for more action is the Affordable Care Act. You know, we were the precursors in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, not utopia, but maybe not so bad. Uh, what would you like to see done to make things better? Well, I, I think the, 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 the challenge with the Affordable Care Act, and, and, and uh, look, you know, we, we have to be fixing the health care problem. And unfortunately, fortunately the, the health care price problem was not, you know, it wasn't uh, benefited by the, the Affordable Care Act. It just, you know, it, it did allow for greater coverage, and, and, and I respect that, that objective. Um, a greater coverage of more people, but it didn't actually, you know, t touch any of the, the levers of what, what makes affordability such a challenge. And in fact, you know, in a lot of ways, it eviscerated some of the great strengths of what we were doing well in Massachusetts. So it's a complicated sort of question. Um, you know, when I approach this, when I'm in Washington, when I, you know, when I uh, uh, get elected, I, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to put the interests of Massachusetts first, last, and always. Right? That, that that you know, we had a good we had a good program working. We, it, you said it wasn't utopia, but it was a good, solid program. And then every time the dial switch in Washington, it, it's throwing off the equilibrium of our Massachusetts program, and I, and I don't like to see that happen. Turning to the economy in Massachusetts, uh, unemployment is, is way down, but you know we still have the skills gap that hurts both employers and potential employees. What would you do about that? Oh, fantastic question. I, I don't get asked that one enough. Uh, I'm so excited about, about the, 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 the new American possibilities available to us. The skills gap is, is, uh, is not that challenging to, 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 to cross. You know, there, there's some great, great, gray collar, you know, positions. Not, not the old blue collar, not the white collar positions. Gray collar positions, where with a certain mod, relatively modest of, uh, level of technical aptitude, which can be imparted by three, six, twelve months of schooling, then then uh, there are good paying jobs in the state. There are employers that are dying for, you know, for skilled laborers. Now, now, the, now there are. Uh, um, uh, good, pro good progress being made, you know, with the technical schools and and the community colleges. But we need to continue. This is a state question, not so much a federal question. You know, I'm running for U.S. Senate, but on the state level, we're doing a pretty good job of getting ourselves retooled, allowing students to know there's a better, there's, there may be for some of them a better opportunity to not go to a four-year college, but to get themselves into the into a a, a mainstream um, good job by virtue of a technical school or or um, some other technical skills. Well, one thing the Senate is going to be doing pretty soon is deciding on the nominee to the U.S. Supreme Court by President Trump, Brett Kavanaugh. Well, how would you approach that? Well, I, I think what's unfortunate about this is, is, is the, um, our selections to the Supreme Court have just become too political, right? Um, it, it's, it's, I'm just looking for somebody that's going to apply the law, however it's written, you know? concept of the Constitution, the concept of, of precedent, you know, which comes down from the Constitution. And, and we end up, you know, with this big political scrum each time about whether the, whether the nominations are going to be heard or not, which I just think is, is, is not right. Um, you know, I, th I think it should be basically, it's the purview of, a, of an administration, um, whoever the administration is at a time, to nominate somebody and, and, the, and the, the Senate ought to, ought to hear their nominations and, and proceed based upon uh, whether they've got the credentials or not. You know, unfortunately, again, in the, the, in the highly politicized category, you know, the night, the night that Brett Kavanaugh was, was uh, nominated, Elizabeth Warren came out within minutes saying she was opposing it. I mean, that's just not the right way to do this, right? The right way to do this is to say, let's look at his credentials. Now, you said she was uh, divisive and obstructionist. Now, at the risk of getting you in trouble here, if you were to win, um, is she any more obstructionist than Mitch McConnell was last year? Well, uh, you know, I think, I think what you, what you look at, if you look at, her, look at her record, then you'll see um, a consistent, um, you know, pattern of, of, two, of two things. One is, is no's on almost everything, right? She voted no on approximately 100 of the administration's 115 nominees for all sorts of positions. Whatever you think of the Trump administration, um, 
you think they're be it's it's a better it's better if they actually have people in positions than not because that's what that's what makes the country run right he, he, the president needs a cabinet it's better to have a defense secretary or a whatever um, you know than not have one and she voted against you no know, and almost everything she continues to d demonstrate that she's a, you know she she marks herself as an outlier even within her own party. Um, you know, the, the, you look at, uh, for example, the 21st Century Cures Act, where she was one of only four senators in the country to vote against that. I'm not even sure on what grounds. And it was it was to provide greater opioid, um, you know, uh, spending and and also to help the medical device industry, which is which is uh, you know very important here in Massachusetts. And finally, just recently, she voted against, you know, veter veterans uh, affairs um, support and um, and supporting uh, an increase in our service men and women's pay. Uh, it's one of only a handful of senators again to do that. It, you know, even in, a, in her own party, she's considered the out, outlier. You know, and 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 I, I do think that makes her different in kind. You know, there there are other more reasonable Democrats that that I think you know they stand on principle when they're against something, but they don't stand against everything. I, I, I got to ask you about a, a couple of uh, um, budget uh, questions here. Uh, uh, you, you favor some more tax cuts, but you're also very concerned about the national debt. So how how do you reconcile those? Well, the the, the the concept is that it took it. You know, it's unfortunate. You know, I, I think um, rational observers from the, the right and from the left used to agree um, that we can't have um, you know trillion dollar uh, deficits annually um, and and a, and a twenty now two trillion dollar debt in aggregate. We we still agree on that. I mean, you know, there's, there was, some people were, were were more aggressive on that. And some people were less aggressive. And some people thought you could stimulus spend for a while. You know, the Keynesians and all of that. But we basically thought over time we ought to address that. Now nobody's even talking about it. It's, it's, not, even on, it's not even on the map of Washington anymore. And you want to talk about a, a, a broken Washington problem. It's that nobody even talks about the fact that we're running a trillion dollar annual deficit. And it's, the, the fixes to this are not going to happen overnight. It took a long time to get into this mess. It's going to take us a while to get out of it. We need to sharpen pencils on a bipartisan basis. People sit down together and say, hey, how do we do this over the next 10 to 20 years? Because otherwise, um, you know, what, what this means is that my generation and your generation, uh, we've spent irresponsibly and handed down the, 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 you know, the bill to our kids and grandkids, and that doesn't make any sense. This is not the way a great nation conducts its affairs. Well, I have to ask you about another kind of competition you're facing in September, in addition to the other two Republicans on the ballot, is that uh, you know, we have some important elections coming up in offices like district attorney. So uh, you're asking unenrolled voters maybe uh, to maybe forego that so they can vote for one of the Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, why should they? Well, I, I think anybody anybody who's unenrolled, if they want to change in Washington, uh, they should they should get get uh, to the Republican primary on September fourth, because I'm the guy, you know, that I can represent the the, the spectrum of of ideas. Um, you know, I have demonstrated my entire life that I bring people together. I'm modeling it in my campaign right now, in my campaign right now, and it's hard to do, but I'm I, I'm I've, I'm really working hard at it. I've got senior level campaign uh, operatives and management people that are Democrats, that are independents, that are black, white, Latino, and Asian. And that's important to me because that's what I'm modeling what I'm going to do in Washington when I get there. So if people want to see how it can happen, that we're going to bring our country back together again, start a movement to say, you know what, it's possible. Look at the Kingston campaign because that's what we're doing. Thank you very much for being with us. Pleasure to be here. John Kingston, Republican candidate for U.S. Senate in the primary on September 4th. Thank you, Chris. In a moment, new developments in the MLK Scholars Program.